Okay, so I have a few of you guys commenting under my AccuPlacer um, portion of the exam, and you guys are like, where are questions number 17 through 20? And the answer is, I have no idea. So I don't know why I haven't recorded a video for number 17, 17 through 20, but I'm gonna go ahead and do that for you guys now. And in this video, I'm just gonna show you guys how to do it the easiest, simplest way. And the reason being is because I don't like any of these problems. I don't like them at all. So I'm just gonna teach you guys the easiest way to get through these so that when you take your test, you feel a little bit more confident. So as always, please make sure you have your pen and your paper ready and let's get started with problem number 17. All right, so problem number 17 says, the elevation at the summit of Mount Whitney is 4,418 meters above sea level. And I'm just gonna draw a picture as I'm reading this. So here is Mount Whitney and it's 4,418 meters. Climbers begin at the trailhead that has an elevation of 2,550 meters above sea level. So I'm not really sure what a trailhead is, but I kind of get the point that it's something that's close by the first mountain and that's at 2,550 meters. It says, what is the change in elevation to the nearest foot between the trailhead and the summit? One foot is equal to 0 0.3048 meters. Okay, so they're literally just asking us for what is the difference between this elevation and that elevation. So we're just subtracting. So we're gonna subtract 4,418 minus 2,550. So eight minus zero is eight. You can't do one minus five, so you borrow from the four, make that a three, make this 11. 11 minus five is six. You can't do three minus five, so you have to borrow again from the four. Four becomes a three, that three becomes 13. 13 minus five is eight, and then three minus two is one. So the difference is 1,868 meters, but they're actually asking us in the nearest foot. So they want us to go from meters to feet. And so anytime we're changing from one form of measurement to another, we're usually gonna set up a proportion. So they tell us how to set up the proportion. The proportion is just two fractions that are equal to each other. And this first fraction is gonna be the rate. And the second fraction is gonna be the information that we're given. So the rate was given, one foot is 0 0.3048 meters. So we're gonna write one foot on the top and then we're gonna put 0 0.3048 meters on the bottom. So because I put feet on the top and meters on the bottom, I'm gonna to have to do that again. Feet on top, meters on the bottom. So the, we figured out how many meters it's equal to. So it's 1,868 meters. And we're gonna figure out how many feet that is. So we're just gonna put X on top. So now we have a proportion that we're gonna go ahead and solve. We're gonna go ahead and solve this by cross multiplying. So we're gonna cross multiply 0 0.3048 3048 times x, which is just 0 0.3048 x, and that's equal to 1 times 1868, which is 1868. And then again, we're trying to get the x by itself. To get the x by itself, we have to divide both sides by 0 0.3048, 0 0.3048. And we end up getting X is equal to 6,128.6. Now, the question is saying to the nearest foot. Anytime you see the word nearest, you know that you're going to have to round. So we're going to round this answer here to the nearest foot. So we're going to round it to the nearest whole number. So 6,128.6. We underline the number that we're rounding to, the nearest whole number. We're going to make the arrow to the right. If that number is five or above, then we round up. If the number is four or below, then we keep it the same. Because this number is six, we're going to round up. So 6,128.6 is going to be rounded to 6,129. That's gonna be in feet. And so our answer is going to be C. All right, so we did a lot here, but just as a review, I drew a picture because a picture helps me to understand what's going on. But really, we were just trying to find the difference in elevation. So we subtract the higher height from the lower height. We were able to find the difference in elevation. 
And then we had to convert that difference in elevation into feet because it was in meters. We know that anytime we're changing a measurement from one form of measurement to another, then we have to set up a proportion. The first proportion is always the rate. They'll give you the rate. And then the second fraction is always the information that we're given and the information that we're trying to find. We went ahead and cross multiplied and we found our answer. And then again, we had to round that answer. So anytime you're rounding, you can take notes on the side of your paper. Anytime you're rounding, you look at the number to the right. If it's five or above, you round up. And if it's four or below, you keep the same. That's good to remember if you're unfamiliar with rounding or if it's been a long time since you've rounded numbers. Okay, how are you guys feeling so far? Make sense? Okay, good. So now we're gonna go ahead and go to question number 18. So we're given two equations. So automatically when we see something like this where they're given two equations right below one another, we're probably solving a system of equations. Okay, and that usually means that we're gonna have to use each equation in order to solve it. So let's go ahead and read the problem. It says the two lines given by the equations above intersect in the xy plane. What is the value of the y coordinate of the point of the intersection? Okay, so there's many ways that you can solve a system of equations, but normally you, like I said, you use one equation to solve the other equation. And so there's something called solving system of equations by using substitution, okay? So we want to 3x minus 2y, I'm gonna rewrite this out, equals 15. We wanna use either one of these equations and be able to put it into the other equation in order to solve it. Well, since we know in the second equation that x is equal to three, we can easily plug x equals to three into this first equation and figure out what y is equal to. And that's what it's asking for, the y coordinate. So let's go ahead and see how that works out. So 3x minus 2y is equal to 15. We're going to go ahead and put in 3 for x. And now we only have one variable that we can solve for. Before, there were two variables, and it's hard to solve an equation that has two variables. But now the equation only has one variable for us to solve for. So let's figure out what y is equal to. So first, we're going to do 3 times 3, which is 9. 9 minus 2y equals 15. Now this just turns into a two-step equation. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get the 9 to the other side. So I'm going to subtract 9 from both sides. So we're left with negative 2y on this side is equal to 15 minus 9, which is 6. To get that y by itself, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 2. So y is going to be equal to negative 3. And so the answer is going to be B. Again, so we, have to, we saw that there were two equations here. We know that we're trying to solve a system of equations. One way to solve a system of equations is through substitution. We were able to substitute this X for three because we knew in the second equation that X is equal to three. It was very simply laid out for us. And so we plugged in three into that first equation and we were able to find that Y is equal to negative three. If you have any questions for me, please let me know. Otherwise, we're just gonna go ahead and move on to our next question. So question number 19. I really don't like this one, you guys, but it's so easy when you understand it. And that's the thing. It's like math is a language. It's like once you understand math language, math problems become so much easier. So don't get overwhelmed by this problem. I at first got overwhelmed by it, then I learned math language, and then now I'm gonna teach you the math language. Okay, so they're showing us different sets. This is the L set, this is the M set, and that's the N set. Very simple, just three different sets of numbers. Okay, so it's saying sets L, M, and N are shown above. Which of the following sets represents L? And then it's the union of L with the intersection of sets M and N. Okay, so first we're gonna look at the intersection of sets M and N. So that's what this means, intersection, of n, m, and n. Okay, what that means is if you look at these two sets, m and n, what numbers do you see appear in both lists? So if you look at it closely, 
you see 10 and 10, so 10 go appears in both lists, and 20 and 20. And those are the only numbers that appear in both lists, M and N. So that would be 10 and 20. Okay, perfect. So now we have this portion, the intersection of M and N. So anytime you see the word intersection, that means you look at the two lists of numbers and see what numbers appears in both of them. Then it's asking us for the union of L. So now it's asking us for the union of L. Well, what does that mean, the union of L? That just means plus this set of numbers plus any numbers that are also found in L. So if we look at L, L is a set of 0, 20, 40, 80, and 100. So now they want to add any of those other numbers that are not found here into this set. So it would be 0. Then we'd add 10 x 10, 20, 40, 80, and 100. We literally just added all the numbers in here with all the numbers in here. So anytime you see it saying um, the union of something, that means you're just adding any numbers that are in this set to what you just found. So the answer is going to be B because this is the union of L plus the set of the intersection of M and N. Okay, so I don't like this question because it can seem more confusing than it has to be. And I don't want you guys to leave my video feeling confused. If you leave my video because you're bored, <laughs> I really don't blame you with this one because this is, this is quite the problem. These are, these are problems, they really are. Um, but if you are sticking with it and you really are just determined to pass, just hang in there just for one more second. Just see this again without me explaining too much. So they are talking about the intersection of M and N. Intersection just means look at the two lists, M and N, and see what numbers appear in both lists. 10 and 20 appears in both lists. So the intersection of M and N literally is just the two numbers that appear in both lists. Perfect. Then they want you to also represent the union of L, meaning include any of the numbers that are in L that you haven't included yet. So they want you just to add the numbers that are in L. So let's just add all the numbers, 0, 20, 40, 80, and 100. Now they just basically want you to take this list and this list and make a list. So we're going to do 0, 10, 20, 40, 80, 100. And our answer is going to be B. Intersection just means look at the two lists of numbers, figure out which numbers are the same. And then union means just add all the numbers in that set. I hope this makes sense to you guys. Please comment underneath if it doesn't. Um, let's go ahead and just go to question number 20. You're really going to like how I explain number 20 because it's not as complicated as the problem tries to make it seem. Okay, question number 20. Okay, the triangle PQR, so they're talking about this triangle. Mm, they're telling us what the coordinates are. They're telling us this triangle is gonna be rotated 180 degrees clockwise about the origin. Again, this is all language. So let's just break down the language so that the question is more clear to you guys. So when it's saying the triangle PQR, you're calling it PQR because that's the points on the triangle, P, Q, and R. So if it was A, B, C, if it was E, F, G, elemental P, well, that couldn't be a triangle, but that's just how they name triangles. Then they're talking about rotating something 180 degrees clockwise around the origin. So if you guys look at this X, Y axis, the origin is the very center of the graph. So that is the origin. Now, when they're saying clockwise, clockwise means you're going over to the right. So clockwise, think of how a clock tells time, it ticks that direction. So that's the direction that you're gonna be going. And then I want you guys to look at this, just draw a circle around the graph, just so you understand what they're talking about. A complete circle is 360 degrees. So 
360 degrees divided by four is 90 degrees each turn. 90 degrees, 90 degrees. So if this triangle starts here, but then it goes 180 degrees, it would end up here. The reason why 90 plus 90 is 180 degrees. So this triangle would end up in this quadrant over here. Are you following? So if I, they told me that we're rotating 180 degrees clockwise, so we're going around this way, and we went 180 degrees, 90 degrees, and 90 degrees, so we end up in this quadrant, we're in the right area to begin with. Then it says we're going to reflect that triangle across the y-axis. So when you reflect something across the y-axis, it's as if you're putting a mirror down the y-axis. So when you reflect it, this triangle should appear on this side. So you're going to end up with a triangle in this quadrant. That's the only possible way that you could end up with a triangle that has been rotated 180 degrees around the origin and then reflected over the y-axis. This is the only quadrant it can land in. But it's asking what are the, co the coordinates of Q? So you have to just see which one of these points would end up in this quadrant. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase all of this and we're just gonna go ahead and graph these points. So point A, is negative three, negative two. So negative three, negative two would be over here. So it's not in the right quadrant. So A is not the answer. B would be three, negative two. So one, two, three, negative two. So that'd be three, negative two. That is not in the right quadrant. Quadrant. So that is not the answer. We're looking for a point in this quadrant. Okay, what about C? Negative two, three. So negative two up three, two, three would be here. Again, that's not going to be the right answer because that's in this quadrant. We're looking for a point in this quadrant. So then let's check to see if 2, 3 is our answer. So 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. That point is in the right quadrant, so it can only be D, 2, comma 3 as the answer. All right, how are you guys feeling? Please, good vibes, please, 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 good vibes. All right, so... Before we just end the video, just do you want to watch that again? If you don't want to watch it again, please check out my other videos. If you do want to watch it again, here, why not? Let me just show you without all the complications and everything explaining. So again, the origin is at the center of the graph. We're going to go clockwise, which means we're going to go to the right. Every quadrant is 90 degrees. Okay. So this triangle is going to go 180 degrees. So 90 and 90, it's going to end up, that's 180 degrees. So it's going to end up here. So it's going to end up in this area right here. Perfect. And then it's going to be reflected over the y-axis. So when it's reflected over the y-axis, this is the y-axis. You put the mirror here and you're going to see it come up on this side. So the Q is going to be around that area. So what we did was we figured out what quadrant the triangle is going to be in. And so we know that the coordinates of Q is going to have to end up in this quadrant. So we graphed all four of these points on the graph. And we saw that 2, 3 was the only point that appeared in this quadrant. And so we know that D is our answer. All right, comment below. Tell me how you're feeling. This was a lot. But I hope that me breaking this down helped you guys a little bit. Please let me know. Love you guys, and I hope you do well on your tests. Text me and tell me what you guys need help with next. Talk to you soon.